How did that song go? Is love blind? Is love blind? Let's find out. Was it that? Anyway, let's watch. Matt can kiss my ass. Talking about love and all this stuff, and sometimes I even feel uncomfortable even saying that word. You pick the number, and then you get a corresponding question. Number four, please. This one's been requested a couple times. It would try to be something different. Maybe first interactions is in my strong suit. Is it an act? Is this a troll? He insulted her because she picked four, and he asked her, are you, tr you know, are you trying to be a copy? What did he say? Then you get a corresponding question. Number four, please. This one's been requested a couple times. It would try to be something different. I'm trying to be something different. So he is speaking kind of half sentences, but it sounds like he's insulting her for being a copycat, which is, how does that make any sense? How would she know and why? So either he's a troll or he is so socially nervous that he is actually lashing out. That will happen for sure. Or he has a perceptual problem. Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to go down this road, but there are uh, mental conditions that can result in individuals having episodes of time in which they will perceive things that are not attached to reality. I'll just say that. That's it's on the list. Either way, like I said, I don't think Matthew's gonna make it to the next phase. Something I think would be fun. Putting myself out there is completely out of character for me. You have nice energy. Thank you. But if I can find my wife from this experience, then I guess that's something I'm willing to do. Superman had a cold personality to start off to. And then you'll add the hypothesis that he's been indoctrinated into an online cult of a weird version of masculinity, you know, incels, these people, and has conditioned himself to approach life in a certain way, maybe a, a hostile way, I don't know. There's also a possibility that he is a little socially awkward and he doesn't actually want to be here and he is either purposely sabotaging or or subconsciously sabotaging the situation. Man, right off the bat, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm certainly not doing this to become a C-list celebrity. Well, that's good news. I'm the king of first impressions. Uh, you've, you've made a lasting impression. This is like so awkward for my personality. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, it's hard to, something's going on, right? Because either he's faking it or he is genuinely that awkward and probably socially anxious at the same time. You know, it's normal for when people are awkward socially, they know that they're not operating in the smooth flow of conversation that they see happening. And everyone's worried about rejection and being judged. And so chronically, if you have that deficit in social skill, you are going to develop a lot of uh, trauma, a lot of terror and fear and negative associations with the task at hand, which is to socialize. And that's gonna trip you up even more. You can think about this for yourself. When you are awkward or you're worried about being awkward, you feel like you're under the microscope, you know, like you're at a party and you, you don't know anybody or you only know one person and that person is talking with other people. You can think about what you resort to or you are at the same party and they're going around the room introducing themselves. What is your go-to vibe? Do you just dip in and out and say, hey, you know, my name's so-and-so and I just say, hey, hi everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. And then you dip out. Do you say an awkward joke? Do you run out of the room? <laughs> Do you get angry? You know, there's a lot of different responses, and one of them is to get angry. One of them is to become hostile, even though you're not in a situation that calls for that. No one is being hostile to you, but your way of pushing people away and your way of feeling a little bit more power when you're, when you're terrified is to 
become hostile and to blame other people. You might even think that other people are judging you or being unfair or invading your space or something like that. And, you know, I'll add that to the list. You know, there are personality disorders that involve invasion of space. And you can listen to my whole deep dive on schizoid personality disorder, but it's a common feature, not universal, but a common feature that people with schizoid personality disorder will often feel like people are invading their inner world when they're not. Like if you ask someone with schizoid personality disorder and it was untreated, meaning the person hadn't gone through treatment and they lacked insight into their reactivity, and you just ask them a simple question like, how are you doing today? They can react the way that he did, you know, either by internally rejecting or by externally. Like, what's it to you? Like, why are you? Wow. That, in fact, he said a number of things. <laughs> along those lines. And people with schizoid personality disorder, it's, it's highly associated with, with autism spectrum, but in my clinical experience, it's easy to tell the difference between the two. Anyway, you can listen to my whole deep dive on it. For these individuals, do their relational traumas growing up, that had to do often with enmeshment and invasion. They are perceptually distorted around feeling as though they're always being invaded unfairly. You know, to, to them, if you walk, not, again, not all of them, but if you walk up to them and ask a simple question like, how are you doing today? Or how are things faring for you today? Or, uh, well, I told you my goals, what are your goals? Or I told you what I excel at in a relationship, what do you, what do you excel at? What uh, they see is as if you had asked them to give them a complete rundown of your medical history or to hand over your bank account statements or something. Uh, if someone asked you those questions in a situation like that, you would you would act a little prickly, like, well, pff, that's a little presumptuous, or that's a little forward of you. Anyway, getting back to, or, or even just walk out of the room, right? As I say this, I mean, it's not. <laughs> when it comes to schizoid precise order, it takes me months to feel confident in the construct being applied, but but uh, it, it would explain it. <laughs> right. And when individuals grow up with schizoid and the traumas and their reactivity, it, you know, it's with them in, in all likelihood since they were a young child. We don't diagnose children with it because we can't know until their personality becomes a little bit more solidified as an adult, but it's with them throughout their life. They will have a really hard time developing social skills because they are frequently being prickly and avoiding and also believing that they don't need anybody is another thing that will happen, even though they absolutely do because it's human to need other humans. So I, I, I don't know. Let's keep an eye on that one. <laughs> at the very least, as a way of providing at least one of the many aspects of schizoid that isn't usually discussed in media, if ever, really. Mm -hmm. So typically you're riding dirt bikes or four wheelers. Showing emotion is weakness. And being in a dating bot is probably the scariest environment possible. But I'm here. You are here. So I think, give me a little more time. And I think maybe I can win you over. Or... So I didn't know that <laughs> I'd get a chance to talk about schizoid. I would never have predicted, honestly, that I'd get a chance to talk about schizoid personality while watching Love is Blind in particular, because people with schizoid would be probably statistically the least likely to actually go on a show like this. But let's use this opportunity to talk about a personality disorder that I rarely get to talk about. So with schizoid personality disorder, the primary trauma, every personality disorder has a primary trauma in the way that I see personality disorders. It, it's easier to understand. Like with borderline, the primary trauma is abandonment. And when you understand that, then you understand why the individual has all the symptoms that they do. I mean, lay people wouldn't necessarily understand, but uh, for people who study personality and treat personality disorders like I do, it makes it easier. Anyways, for schizoid, the primary trauma is usually neglect. Now, the child could also be abused, but it will ha it will have a tone of neglect, meaning that the child will, on average, feel as though there is a lack of attunement or a lack of attention, a lack of being noticed. Now, the child might be tended to in terms of food and shelter, but emotionally, the child is basically ignored. 
In addition to that, child could also be abused, which is awful to think about all the way around. And the other aspect to the primary trauma is that usually the parents were somehow emotionally invasive or even physically invasive. Like a common story you'll hear is that one or more of the parents would randomly just break into the child's room and out of some sort of paranoia, like, you've got drugs in here, or you have porn in here, or what are you doing in here? And there's that kind of invasion. That's That's not a universal thing, obviously, but that's one example of invasion or invasion emotionally of you will tell me what you are feeling. You will tell me what you are thinking. It's, it's aggressive. It's, it's pressured. It's not actually wanting to know the child's inner life. It, it's, it's hostile. It's, it's, it's invasive. And so you both feel neglected and invaded. So you have this perception that you have to be on the lookout for invasion and harm and neglect. Also, Because of the lack of attunement emotionally, you don't have any way as a young child to learn how emotions work. One, because you don't see emotions in your caregivers because they're not around enough. And two, a major function of us learning about emotion, which is very, very important, a major activity as a child is a parent reflecting the emotions to the children. When the child is upset, the parents will say, oh, I see that you're upset. Now, you don't even have to be that explicit. A lot of parents aren't. Without that, some people will just have unbridled emotion. You know, the emotions will be out there, people with histrionic, people with borderline. Or they can go another direction, which is to shut down everything, shut down emotion, get rid of them, deny them because they're confusing, they're difficult, and do everything you can to avoid having any kind of acknowledgement of emotion. And that's what schizoid people uh, resort to when they're very young, when they're two, three years old. And you fast forward through a life and you could be 36 and have never actually learned what emotions are and how to interpret them and how to deal with them. So people with schizoid could have a a one-year-old understanding of emotion and of their inner world. Because, you know, in order to understand, uh, you know, when you understand your emotions, you understand your needs, you understand who you are, you understand the meaning of your life. Without emotion, without meaning, without your needs, you're just drifting through life, trying to meet your needs indirectly, even though you don't know what those needs are. You're just like, well, I, I guess I'll do this. Does this work? I don't know. I don't even know how to know if it's working. And so people with schizoid end up uh, avoiding emotion and people because they also early in life learned, ah, it's just better to not be with other people. It's, it, it, I'm, I'm much safer. I don't need other people. And again, you fast forward through life. They were a loner in school. They were labeled as awkward. Uh, they might be bullied and they're 36 and they've never really had anyone that was close to them. They weren't close to their parents, which is a tragedy. And then that led to not being close to anybody. And so relationships are very weird. Typically you're riding dirt bikes or four wheelers. Showing emotion is weakness. And being in a dating bot is probably the scariest environment possible. But I'm here. You are here. Right, so that, but I'm here. If he were a patient of mine, if I had diagnosed him with the construct and the label, of schizoid personality, I would interpret that as him revealing that inner need that he barely understands. But you hear the rest of his presentation and even the way he delivers it, it's downplaying it because he learned that defense when he was two years old. Not him, (laughs) I don't know about him, but patients I've treated. So I think, give me a little more time. And I think maybe I can win you over or maybe somebody else. Is that something you want to do, win me over? I'm going to try. <laughs> Are these two actually going to make it to the next phase? Because I actually am here for it because that will be interesting. I thought that Matthew was going to you know, flame out rather quickly. I, I was wondering if they were showing us footage of him in the first episode because he, you know, sometimes they'll show us people that flame out really quickly, and it certainly looked like it was going to be that way. But, uh, but who knows? Now, the edit is 
presenting us something later on, maybe he'll exhibit superior social skills. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm open to it. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. That's a good start. Better than the other ones I had today. <laughs> So I just started seeing a therapist like four or five months ago, just because, I don't know, because everybody does. I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, a huge indication he does not have schizoid is what he just said. People with schizoid are some of the least likely people on the planet to go to therapy. It's very, very hard for them for, the, uh, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, well, one, for one big reason is that they're, they're, uh, a large portion of their conscious mind is oriented around the notion that it's actually uh, uh, not useful to ask people for help or to even socialize with other people. They also are very, very perceptually paranoid around personal questions. And therapists ask personal questions, not all of them. You know, there's different styles of therapy, but, you know, generally speaking. And so for these individuals, they're like, why would I go to a therapy? Why would it? they people with schizoid have a hard time answering simple questions like, how are you doing today? They'll feel like that is an invasion. So the fact that he's talking like this is a strong indication he, he doesn't have it. Yeah. And uh, I usually give her one word answers. Mm -hmm. And I told her what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Go on this experiment. You should have seen her face. She's like... <laughs> now, a sign that if I had a patient that had schizoid and they said that, I would categorize that as being within the disorder, which is to give one word answers. That's a very common thing for people with schizoid, or, or at the very least, very, very brief answers. In contrast to everyone else in therapy who, if I don't ask a question, they won't stop talking. Not because they're yammerers like me, but there's just a lot of things to talk about and people don't get an opportunity to be truly heard by somebody. So that's usually what therapy is. It's just wall-to-wall -wall clients talking. I've never been on a farm or in dirt. So it's like we're almost like opposites, but I feel like you are a great guy. Well, I appreciate that. Because I did, I had a great time in here. The beginning was a little strange, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. So... Are, wow, are they going to become a couple? Now, he's starting to socialize more typically, although I wouldn't say he's super on the... He's just, in contrast to him before, he's more socially able and warm, but still not as able or warm as others in terms of the edit. But, you know, when you started talking, I was like, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> And this is surprising because I thought he was doomed because it seemed as though the women were conferring with each other in the pods, which is normal, right? Like, who'd you, like did you talk? Because imagine talking with him in one of the previous dates and you come out, you go to the lounge and you, it's just like, Does anyone, did anyone talk to Matthew? Because I, I had a weird experience with him and I was worried that word of mouth would <laughs> doom him but seems like maybe not entirely at the very least. I feel like I talked a lot. He did. Congratulations. Feels uncomfortable. Welcome to the party. <laughs> We're all uncomfortable. You finally arrived. I think you're extremely sweet. <laughs> and maybe she's the perfect person for him, whatever is going on at the, you know. Okay, well, what can we say for sure about him? Well. He is telling us and showing us that he has trouble with emotions and socializing. Regardless of what label we put to it or how severe it is, I'm going to take a guess and say that there's a reason why he has those difficulties. Probably due to experiences, probably in his early life, probably his family, his parents, the parenting he went through has something to do with it. So he is talking about that and uh, he's, he's saying he's going to therapy and... I wonder why. He's also saying that he has one word, one word answers. So he's trying to grow. Okay, so someone actually sent me something in the mail. If you wanna send us anything, a card or whatever, you can find the address on our website, I believe. It is from, who's it from? Amy, 
from Minnesota. She says, Happy New Year. You are truly the best fucking therapist on the planet. Ah. <laughs> um, keep being Dr. Kirk. And then, uh, oh. <laughs> she sent me a, a, a mug, best therapist ever. Ah, uh, that's nice. Well, thanks, Amy. And you're the best fucking fan ever. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.